moments for me. And if you're expecting me to sit up here and tell you what a great result of my and you must engage RPS to run an exodus jewelry, you will leave now because you're be disappointed. Uh, because what I want to do is rip the guts out of deliberation. So why would I do that and what authority do I have? Um, I've been running, I ran my first deliberative process in 1999, when I worked for GHT, um, and I've been running them ever since, and uh, so I've done a lot. And I love them, and I love deliberative processes, and I love being a facilitator, and it's marvellous, and people are transformed, and it's <coughs> wonderful, and we all want to do it. However, there are major complexities and issues around deliberation that I'm experiencing, and I'm interested in us actually having a straight conversation about what that might mean for us as practitioners. What happens, I've seen this happen with a number of things. Five years ago, the buzzword was World Cafe. We're all doing World Cafe. Now we're all doing deliberative processes. And what I'm seeing is that some people are doing some bloody kick-ass deliberative processes. Some people are doing some okay processes. And some people are doing something that actually isn't deliberative at all, but we're calling it deliberative because that's new and shiny. Um, and that's okay, but let's get clear about what it is that we're doing. One of the other things that really concerns me is there are some significant deficits with the deliberative process. It cannot, it must not, it should not replace a broader scale, multi-channel engagement program. It cannot, it just can't do everything at once. It is not fully inclusive. People of non-Asian <coughs> background, particularly people of Asian descent, do not find argumentative dialogue and debate structures appropriate or comfortable. That's not the way that they solve problems. So if you have got, which is hard to get in the first place, a truly representative group which shows the diversity of the community, there are going to be cultural reasons that some of the people in that room are actually not on the same level playing field as others. And we don't talk about that because at the minute, deliberation is the name of that. So that was my premise, and now I've used up 40 minutes of my 45. So what I'd like to do is just let's have a quick whiz around the room and get an idea of your experience, who you are, your experience of deliberative processes, and what you want to get out of today, starting with you. No real um, experience of delivery processes in a formal way. My hair is stuck in my glasses. <laughs> and uh, my name's Lynette. I work for the United Church um, and the Medical Church Service already, but my job is to um, help implement the recommendations for the Royal Commission of Lost Church. Wow, excellent. Welcome, Lynette. <coughs> I'm Ellen Sanders from the Communications in Canberra, so um, Communications and Engagement Consulting Firm. I've had a bit to do with delivery mm. processes um, and more, I would specifically say delivery processes more than sort of citizens, juries and that type of development, but learning a lot and have yeah, learned a lot of class. Great. Um, I'm Bonnie Carolini from Essential Energy in New South Wales. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really interested in deliberative because it is like a, people are saying... It's the buzzword for yes, your industry. Which, yes, yeah. which is actually really, really annoying. So yeah. Able to have some hard facts I can take back. Okay. Okay. Nice. Um, my name is Jeanette Lipchinski. I work with the Department of Natural Resources, Mines and Energy. Uh, I have no experience. I'm here to learn. Okay. My name is Sarah. I'm going to work again. I'm Mines and Energy. I shared my cake with you last night. Yeah, no experience with it. Fire and emergency services. No experience with, with this, uh, I guess, 
keen to expand the horizons of my organisation and how we can engage. Rather than just tell people stuff, we can figure it out for ourselves. Next. I'm Amy Eastman, I'm Dennis. Uh, Robin Mitchell, I'm from Melton City Council in Victoria. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently in the middle of our first ever delivery of process. Um, um, however, and workshop two is on Tuesday. Um, and the reason we're doing it, we're doing it internally um, and uh, to review our community engagement framework. Um, it's me being a little bit sneaky, I'm trying to learn about the deliberative process. Um, so my dad will have a facilitating for us so I can kind of be the observer. Um, but also, I reckon, I've been at Melton 12 months and I recognise we need to do a bit of culture building so I'm hoping that kind of come out of, out of it as well. But um, uh, we're doing it as a deliberative process because the Draft Local Government Act in Victoria um, is asking all councils to run a deliberative engagement process for their council plan and first budget. So I thought we better at least understand the space. Yes. And so internally it's a very safe place to work out some of those issues that have. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, my name is Jacinta. I'm from Brisbane City Council and I'm from a community engagement team and I've got a deliberative process. I'm Erin from Brisbane City Council. Um, there's a couple of reasons I'm in this room. One is because we have it in our corporate plan to deliver a deliberative engagement once every other year um, and act on what we've heard through our residence survey. And the other is because there's a bit of a buzz from our politicians that we want to do it and I want to make sure that when we do it this year, we'll do it right. Right this year, we'll do it right. Excellent. My name is Ms. Morn, I'm from Mount Morrow, Victoria. And I'm a manager internal engagement with the now um, we just had a new um, structure model about our team to talk all about group engagement, so just to make sure we're doing what we're saying. Excellent. We'll say who we are while we're in the room. Yep. Yeah, sorry, I'll do all the time. I'm Catherine Thompson, I'm from KGA in Sydney, and I came in here because I'm a huge fan of group engagement. I'm rolling out one at the moment um, back in Sydney, and I spent five years looking for a politician, so there's definitely no way to do it. <laughs> Um, and I'm really just in that space. Excellent. Uh, Corey Segan with the City of Edmonton in uh, Canada. Um, deliberative processes are something I want to learn more about. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Malcolm Patterson from uh, Queensland State Government Justice. Um, like Corey, just, I'm sure there's more to it than an autopsy and us being deliberate about it. So I don't want to learn more. Excellent. Uh, Brandon, um, I think after the wedding yesterday, uh, I worked for you. <laughs> I, I, I'm here to learn. I, I, I've never really engaged in this stuff. I don't have two cents on it, but um, I'm sure there are people in the room that do. He does work for me. <laughs> I'm Bridget from GHD in Hobart and keen to learn more about the process and have been a participant in that quite a lot, but keen to get some insights into the other side. Excellent. Um, my name is Yvette Thompson and I know a lot about it because I recruit many publics for deliberative processes. We usually work with the New Roxy Foundation and a number of juries that um, Lucy facilitated in South Wales, Australia, and Australia in South Australia and Victoria. Um, more recently I run my own business doing this. It's my way of supporting my community. Does um, so that have a scholarship? <laughs> and um, yeah, so I know quite a lot about how the process is designed and run and, and Excellent. I'm Susan Crawford. Um, I have my own small consultancy in Sydney called Flowcom. Um, no experience of these sort of processes in, um, in stakeholder engagement, but being a classroom high school teacher in a past life, I've certainly facilitated lots of different yeah. methodologies around this sort of process. Hello, Corey Sullivan from GHD in Sydney. I've um, just recently done the IP2 training, so I learned about it in theory and came to deep dive a little bit more. Yeah. Hi everyone, Anne-Marie Kirkman from GHD, uh, and I've had some exposure to it through local councils. Justin Han from Reputation Institute, no experience in deliverables, um, however have facilitated more focus groups than I can remember. Excellent. Okay, and we've got Christy from IAP2. Hello everyone. And Lisa from Hi Lisa. Okay, so and I have designed and delivered 
So, deliberative processes, just so what makes them different? They've got a couple of components um, that are different. Deliberation just means weighing up, okay? So a deliberative process is choice work, okay? So any process that you're running where you're giving people genuine choice work, where should we do this, should we not do that, should we balance some things, that is a deliberation. Deliberative democracy is the buzzword that has changed everything, and that requires a number of elements. Number one, randomly selected participants. Why randomly selected? Because you hear from the, those, you, you all know, we got a bell curve, we got people on two ends of an extreme, they usually have a position, you hear from them. We don't actually need to go out of our way from hearing those people. We need to hear about from ordinary citizens in the middle. The people who turn up as self-select to our workshops and, folk and you know, activities are turning up because they have an interest. So random selection, pavement incentive, get the voice of everyday citizens. However, one of the key differences is whether you demographically match them, and that's what Nevek was talking about, to create a mini public. The argument being, we have an issue, it will have an impact on this community, we can't work with the entire community around the complexity of this issue to understand their thoughts about impacts and recommendations, so we've created a mini public. This is broadly what that broader community looks like. This is broadly what you look like. You broadly match if you are, in essence, a mini public. So that's a very important key bit. So when we talk about the key demographics, we mean age, because who do we hear from in self-select processes? Old white people. So having a good selection across young people, working families, those kind of things, as well as um, retired engineers. Gender, for obvious reasons. Then you get down to issues around income or education, or renter or owner. Because what you're trying to do there is get a socioeconomic um, match. I'm, you know, so that's broadly it. You don't just want entitled rich people. You actually want people who <coughs> have um, a different experience. So the concept of a mini public. Um, one of the other big things is they have to have a question to solve. So it's so interesting that your your council said, well, we're going to have a deliberative process every second year and we'll do something that the residents have raised. It actually has to be something that, uh, that there's a reason for why it needs to be debated. So, for example, Byron Shire Council earlier this year we ran a process around their infrastructure spend. You know, like they have major <coughs> strains between non urban areas and urban areas about where the infrastructure spend should be. Council was held to ransom by squeaky wheels and stakeholder groups. They ran a deliberative process to cut through that to get some advice on infrastructure spend. It was so successful they're now going into their second um, approach. So, very good for a meaty problem. It's got to have some substance to it, but it's also got to have some definition. And one of the issues that we don't talk enough about enough is that charge. You use a, you use a charge because the model originally came from, from juries. With criminal juries, you have a charge, you have witnesses, you have evidence. You know, that's where citizens' jury came from. So that core question is really important. How much are you actually prepared to do about what people say? Because when you get a mini public together, they have an expectation that you will act on what, you are, what they are saying. So if you choose not to, you know, hell has no fury. Um, so they're the kind of key, well, the other thing is time and access to information. The other aspect about deliberation which makes it quite different is the group has the opportunity to identify the information that they will need in order to address the issue. And you have to deliver that information to them. And you have to give it to them in, in a way so that they have the time to actually make sense of it so that they can bring it on. So they're the kind of four key elements around the progression. Have I missed anything? Helen and the bit. I mean, I think they're just for the poor big ones. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, it, it, the question, we get charged, 
and then the level of authority. Yeah, the level of authority. What are they going to actually do with it? Um, and a classic of that was the City of Sydney nightlife jury, in which, you know, two weeks into the process, the Premier just made a decision on lockout laws that they're now saying, I heard this morning, and probably going to be received before the next election. So, you know, so the whole jury is there basically saying, what the fuck? Uh, okay, I think I'm going to swear. Um, <laughs> So, um, so they're the kind of basic elements around deliberation. <coughs> the things that I see that we have the biggest problem about, the inclusivity, the actual appropriateness of the process for people, as I said before, of, of culturally and linguistically diverse, people with, um, you know, certainly people with intellectual disability or lower levels of um, articulation and confidence and education suffer in a process which is easily dominated by articulate sophisticates, particularly those who've been to university and so who have the basics of sophistry and argument and debate. There is no doubt that that occurs. So that's a major issue for me. One of the big issues about a mini public is, so we've got you as a mini public, we want you to bring your individual skills, knowledge and expertise, but we want you to make decisions on behalf of the wider community. That's the whole point of creating a mini public. So one of the biggest problems that people have is how do you work a diverse group to make one decision or two decisions, but to make decisions that they will agree with on behalf of the wider community. And so that's the big shift. It's not a bloody vote. And how you negotiate that with the group what is consensus? What does that look like? Is consensus 51% of the group agreeing to something? Is consensus 100% of the group agreeing to something? Is consensus a super majority, which is what Ian from New Democracy says? And then how you actually get them to that point? That's where I see issues. Very easy for me to work you as a group and to get you to come to a conclusion. But when I've got 10 tables of you, getting you to agree with what they said as well, it becomes, it comes more to the money. And people give in, people give up, people get worn down. I'm not allowed to say that, but that is actually what I see happening. So that's one of the issues that I have concerns about. Um, yes? In uh, Northern Ireland, they go back here. So, consensus <coughs> by definition doesn't have to be. I know. So, yeah, so, yeah. go on. The question is, though, if they vote at the end, is it 51%? Like, I mean, the gender equality since during recent in Victoria, you know, it, it was a show of hands, but it was more of a super majority, and it was allowed to have a minority report. But, you know, it wouldn't have been, you know, 41 people over uh, 39. You know, it, I, mean, I just don't think. You know, like consensus. I mean, you weren't there, but the way Abby ran the city was sitting on the last one. You know, we just went, how many people disagree? And then, you know, if, if there wasn't enough of them, we just went, right, oh, that's carry. You know, because you had to make decisions. But you really had a, an overwhelming majority. You know? And this, so this is a really vexed point because what happens in the delivery process is it's necessarily time limited, and it has to be time limited. Because for some people, they'll never make a decision. My husband will never make a decision. My friends, Mary and Richard, have been talking about renovating their backyard since I met them 18 years ago. They'll never make the decision. So you have to have a time limit. But once you have that time limit, there's some real tensions there for people in the group. And the last two juries that I've run, I am not convinced that it had, that the support of those final recommendations was as complete as was presented. And I facilitated. Speaking okay. time, that's 20 minutes. 20 minutes, left. thank you. So, that's some of the issues that I see. Um, <coughs> what I'd like you to do now is quickly at your tables, have a quick conversation about what you would like to spend the next 20 minutes undressing or dissecting. Which entrails? Shall we remove from the body of deliberation and inspect? Down your tables. You've got butcher's paper, you've got pectors. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
was the toughest jury to recruit for, and it was the one that we had the biggest drop-offs, wasn't it? But I have to say that I didn't even, like nowadays I actually ask demographic, demographic questions that go to whole community linguistic diversity. I didn't there, but we still got it because that was the, Such that, was, that, was the that was actually lived there. Yeah, you know, there was right. no way you could not have got it, unless of course they culturally they all just said But no. we ended up with 16 people in the room. Like, we just had so many dropouts. Because it was hard. It's hard for people with English is not their their first language and all this cultural diversity. So we had all this stuff going on with people just not participating in conversations and then these really dominant Eastern European characters. And we're like, how do we met Hadley Morris? It was tough. And it wasn't fully it was not fully inclusive. I have to say it the way it is. Okay, what did you come up with? We had a conversation about how delivery processes could actually be to infrastructure. Yeah, so I was I gave my hand an example, but it's probably an interview with a big door and yeah, yeah. And it's very hard, and somebody else was talking about that, like the whole thing, yeah, you were talking about that need sometimes you have to work with the people who are actually most affected. And you're using a deliberative process, but it's actually almost in a co-design process. And it takes time. They thought it would take nine months, it's taken 18 months to bring people along to actually go, okay, so that's why it's got to be that way. And in large infrastructure, I haven't used a jewellery, but we've done that same thing where we actually ran engineering 101 workshops so people could actually start to understand, okay, so that is why you're saying that it has to go here and it can't go over here. You know, like when you actually start, you, know, you get a, 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 an engineer with those, you know, gradient rulers and start saying, well, actually, maybe we can go like that. <laughs> <laughs> they start getting it. Okay, you're on. Um, yeah, so we had a similar sort of comment about the how we can move with cultural and diverse backgrounds. Um, what have we said the consensus? Okay, so the consensus, the consensus decision making is really tough. Okay, one of the ways that you do it, one of the ways you do it is you keep moving people around from the very beginning. Do not let them continue to work in groups with the same people. So number one, as you all know from workshops, people are deeply tribal. They come in and sit next to people that they already know. And after a break, even if they don't know people in the room, they'll come and sit back where they were sitting before. We all do it. We'll go back to our same seats. I'm a little bit more familiar with this seat than I am from a seat over there, so I'm going to sit back where I was before. Move them. It's the one thing I say to participants at the beginning of the process. My job is a servant of the group. It's unlike any other facilitation, that's why facilitators love it. My job is not to serve the client, my job is to be a servant of the group, but the one thing I'll do, which you will hate, is I'm going to move you around all the time. And I explain to them why, and then they get that. So that's one thing you can do. The second thing you can do, which is I think one of the things that we don't spend enough time on, is actually define the charge. The thing that I have noticed is slipping off in practice, is actually saying to the group, what does this question mean to you? What, <coughs> what is it that you want to answer? So when we did more back, one of the bloody good things we did was we defined that charge. So they said, more back in the motor terminal, they had a million bucks to offset the impact of a major piece of infrastructure. Beyond the EIS, forget all the EIS, so all that stuff could be done. It was saying, bloody into motor terminal in the middle of a pretty industrial area. The community, the panel said, okay, if we're going to spend a million bucks, we want to look after the people who are most affected. We want to look after that there's a really high degree of unemployment in this area. We want to do something that, that looks at that. And we want to do something which actually supports young people because we've got young youth on unemployment. By getting them to define the charge before they heard any information, when they came to making decisions, they had those foundations, those anchors to come back to. And, and I, one of the reasons that process, even though it had significant challenges, one of the reasons we hold it up as a success is because of that. The last two juries I did, we did not define the charge so, um, so succinctly. I was the facilitator. I'm designing it, my bad as much as everybody else's. There's lots I can give you a whole lot of good reasons, but we didn't. And I am sure that one of the reasons I am not so comfortable with the outcomes of those two juries 
is because they didn't have that shared alignment on what that question meant. So that is one of the things. Another thing is, what do they think is, what does consensus mean to you? Get them to have that conversation. And then they will have it. Well, I think it's 51%. I vote. You know, it's, it's good enough for the parliament to be a vote. Well, it's good enough for us. And other people say, well, hang on a minute. Consensus means something more than that. It means that, you know, we can't all get, get it. So 51 doesn't work. Get them to define what they agree consensus means. And that will be varied. Some people will say, some groups will say 80%, 90%. Some will say a lower amount, but that's important, I've got three minutes left. Um, finally, you have to actually use a number of techniques, and I have not found a technique that I can put up in front of you and say beautiful. We use feedback frames a lot. Jason Diceman, you all know Democracy. Jason Diceman gave this industry Democracy, he gifted it to us all. He is now making a product called Feedback Frames, which is excellent. It means you can vote without people seeing the results. I encourage you all to invest in Feedback Frames. They're from, they're from Canada. You probably know Jason. No. Oh, he's a prime up, Jason. Um, feedback Frames are really helpful, particularly when, when a, one of the things they'll do is they'll come up with 30 recommendations. Feedback Frames, you'll get it down to about 12 or 15. You can easily see, well, there's actually no support for that. Continuum lines is used a lot. I know Max used it both. Continuum lines. So if you support it up there, if you don't support it down here. My problem with continuum lines is it starts being quite peer pressurey. So on some stuff it works really well, but on other stuff you can see people kind of shut, you know, it, it, it's, it's got some ifs used. Sometimes you just have to weed that stuff out really early. We're only going to go with stuff that, you know, that you're really strong with. And we're just going to leave the hard stuff. And if we have enough time, we'll come back to the hard stuff. One of the things of a deliberative process is all their ideas and all their thinking should be lost anyway. You should be including all that in the back of their report so that the organisation has it to consider as they go along. Recruitment I'm not touching on, and the only reason I'm not touching on is because you actually have. There are two organisations in this country that I know of, and Colonel and I know of others, Nevet and Jetty Research. With Jetty Research, small market research company based out of Coffs. I've been working with James Parker since 2007 when I ran my first jury. And Nevet also recruits. So Nevet, you've got an expert in the room. She will tell you, and she's learned the hard way, as you just heard, what works and how to do it. Okay, have we got the entrails out? Look, there's not enough time. I know they gave me 45 minutes, what can I say? Yeah, it's gone. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. My name is Lucy Collins and I work at uh, Straight Talk, part of the RPS group. Um, I am always happy to be annoyed with questions. I am always happy if you're in Sydney to have a cup of coffee. Just look me up on the website, drop me an email. Um, I am, you know, apparently I inspired the I Love I Do For Two slogan. Um, I have been involved since the early days. If this is my passion, giving back to this industry that has given me the most amazing career. So please, if after this you have any questions, just harangue me electronically and I will happily um, play with you. Look! <laughs>
because it was what our stakeholders uh, were thinking of our business that really affected uh, the organisation. And when I say stakeholders for a company in energy that I know some of you are involved in, uh, it pretty much involves everyone in the country. So that organisation had over 4 million customers. Uh, it was ASX listed, so it had stakeholders, investors, uh, it had employees, obviously, and also all of the communities in which it operated. So one of the things that we decided to do was not just to trust our gut instinct as uh, communication professionals, but really to start to unpack and understand what are other people's perceptions of us? What are they thinking? What are their issues? What's the trust like? And ultimately, where do we land from a reputational point of view? So to do that, uh, we uh, had the help of the likes of Justin from the Reputation Institute to actually apply a scientific approach to measuring our reputation, to helping us work out what were the levers that enabled us to do things well uh, and things to avoid. Now, I've got a quote for you here that I think is absolutely pertinent to this session today. So the quote is, you know, the who I'm sure you've all heard of. Uh, and the idea here is the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent, and that's power. And we all know that our media absolutely has that power in Australia. So what we're going to share with you today, and thanks for Justin for flying out to do this, is some research of the Reputation Institute. They surveyed 6,000 people earlier in the year to really find out what those sources of media are most trusted. We're going to share that with you. We're going to share a couple of case studies. And along the way, we're actually going to be testing your knowledge and perceptions as well. So we're polling and testing you as we go through. I really like that quote from Malcolm X. Um, I think Denzel Washington was great in the movie. Uh, but uh, the quote is the, that you know the media is powerful. Uh, and it influences, and that's what we do at the Reputation Institute. We try and understand how powerful, or what influence companies have and organisations have on influencing perceptions. Now, uh, we've been doing this for over a decade, and one of the core components of influencing perceptions and influencing people is the level of trust that they have within an organisation. So it's not only trust, it's res respect, admiration, just overall general good feeling and, and the emotional connection that people have to the organisation. And those are really, really core components of what influences people. And why should we care about influencing people? Why should we care about trust? Why should we care about reputation? It's because we know that organisations with very strong reputations, or as, a, as a reputation improves, so does the level of support that you are likely to get from your key stakeholders. So in other words, the higher your reputation, the more likely people are to say something positive about you, support your project, work for you, recommend you, um, and trust you when things go wrong. So, great, we know trust is really important because uh, we want to be able to influence, influence people's behavior. Um, but how do you get people to trust you? You can't just go out there and go, everyone else, guys, we've been around for a long time, trust us doesn't work quite that way. We wish it would, but it doesn't. You need proof points. So at RI, what we've done is we've created a, a model that has really seven levers or seven drivers that you can utilize to be able to influence that level of trust, admiration, respect, and, and good feeling that people have for your organization. Those seven points are products and services. More like services is, is obviously key for this audience, uh, what you're delivering, so the core component of, of what you're actually delivering to the community. Uh, that's one of my innovations, so innovation is not around, I'm not about the new shiny new uh, thing that you've created or the shiny new app that you've developed, it's really about adapting to change, uh, responding to issues, and to some degree if you can do things differently and in some cases using we have workplace, that's a key component. 
looking after your, your employees um, when things go wrong or you underpay people, like we had an example of 7 Eleven, that tends to not help build reputation, it erodes and destroys reputation. Fatalities on a, on, a, on a project, big impact on how people perceive, um, perceive you and the damage you can do to your reputation. Governance is around being open and honest and transparent and behaving ethically. Uh, really big hot topic at the moment, especially for the banks and the Royal Commission. We've seen their scores in this particular um, dimension part. Citizenship is not only about the environment, the CSR projects, it's also around the community um, and how you're actually benefiting Australia and the Australian community as a whole. Leadership is not only the person at the top of the organisation, but the vision for the future and how well you organise. The performance is just really about fiscal responsibility. So those seven areas uh, are really, really important for driving trust and, and improving trust. So, what is the level of trust of the media industry? Alright, so the stop chain grab out your phone or your iPad or computer if you've got access to the internet. All you need to do is open up your browser and type in that code that's on the screen at the moment. If you have any problems, we've got Chloe here, so stick your hand up and she can come around and help you. Do I need a capital P? What was that, sorry? Do I need a capital P? No, you don't. It's not case sensitive. And if you feel like you've managed to get through that, it'll come up the next screen that looks like this. So just pause there for a moment. I'll flip back to this. I can just get a general nod if you feel like you've connected to the application. And if you've got any problems, stick your hand up and Chloe will come around. Alright, I think most of you are on board. You can press skip, you don't need to enter your name for this. And someone's already voted, which is absolutely fine. So you should all find on your screen it works live. You've got options here. So what proportion of Australians do you think trust the media? Is it 20%, 40%, 60% or 80%? Yeah? We're sort of nutting out really here about 40% of people. So what we're going to do now is find out, based on the research of the Reputation Institute, whether you guys have got it right or not. One more question, actually, before we do that. So you should find that it scrolls through now. We've got two choices here. Do you think, on general, people trust the media more? Or do they trust what they see and hear from the alcoholic beverages industry? <laughs> and you guys are all pretty clever. You got it right. <laughs> As Anne-Marie Anne mentioned, we, we conduct research um, throughout the year. Uh, this is from September, our most recent wave, and we thought we would show these results because they are quite topical and it's just after the uh, Royal Commission. But uh, the media industry ranked 27th out of 33 industries, not particularly well um, regarded by the Australian public. Now, this is an industry measure and not a collection of companies that we've utilised to create an industry average, right? So this is a simple question. We give people a range of different industries and we ask them to rate on a, on a scale of one to seven how much they trust in the reputation of that industry. 40% um, of Australians trust the media. If we look at the net positive, so if you take the positive minus the negative, you actually have a net positive of only 6% compared to the alcohol industry, which is 20%. That's a huge difference. Basically means that there's a large proportion of the public that people will not um, trust what the media is telling them. So the net positive is adding 40 Is the 14 minus the 36. 34, sorry. 6% yeah. net positive. Uh, I'm sure you can probably see some of your own industries <coughs> up there, some government services, some construction, some infrastructure, typically um, held uh, in you know, reasonably high regard. I guess I can't put up a ranking without talking about, an industry ranking without talking about the banking industry. Uh, not in great shape at the moment, 
break down the bottom of, of the pile. Uh, net positive of minus 11. So that means there is a higher proportion of people who distrust banking industry and trust the industry at the moment. At the beginning, beginning, beginning of the year in March for the Royal Commission, they were actually at um, 27 position and it was flipped the other way, where it was uh, positive 11%. So the Royal Commission has really had a, had a damaging effect to its overall reputation as an industry. So within an industry, obviously, there's a whole bunch of um, different organizations that, that operate. And just because you operate in an industry doesn't necessarily mean the negative halo of the industry impacts you. So for banks, even though the banking industry is pretty low at the moment, you find that the tier two banks, so your INGs, your Bendigos, and your St. George's are actually performing better than they were prior to Royal Commission, and purely for the reason because they're not one of the big four. So we thought, great, the media industry is really bad, but what about specific media sources? How does that stack up? So we took 28 different media sources and we asked a very simple question on a scale from 1 to 7 of the media sources you use, which ones do you trust? Or how much do you trust that media source from 1 to 7? So, I think we've got another question. We do. So again, we'll grab the phone and you're choosing between whether you think Channel 7 News is more trusted or Google.
but, but very interesting that those three channels of sources are, are very highly trusted. What also stands out for us was that Google is higher than news.com, was quite prominent. Um, we have 7, 8, and 10 in just above the middle of the pile. Uh, and then Sky News, CNN, and Fox News, really down at the bottom. And because it's colored orange, it means that between 0 and 20% net positive score. So it's a really, really low score. And then we have the digital channels of Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. There is a high proportion of people who distrust and trust those media sources. Who would tell us that they distrust? Okay. All right, so that's the whole population, 18 plus. What about specific age groups? What about young people? Maybe they trust digital channels more. And what does that mix look like? So we broke our demographics into three groups. We have the millennials, because everybody talks about the millennials all the time, and it's kind of the benchmark measure that we have to use. And Pew Research um, defines it as the ages of 22 to 37, which is probably a little bit higher than you would have thought. Uh, and then we had, then we created this group called Free Millennials, which is basically <laughs> most people. It is, isn't it? <laughs> Um, and then we have post millennials, which is the, the younger generation. When we look at the top 10, we find that pre millennials have high levels of trust for their top 10, whilst post millennials um, have lower levels of trust in general. And if we look at that gap between the top 10 um, and the bottom 5, we just see this massive difference between the level of the disparity between the high levels of trust and low levels of trust among pre-millennials, where post-millennials are a little bit more forgiving. The band of trust that they're willing to give, um, or the band and the difference of trust is much lower. So what do we do with this information? And if we look at the top 10, uh, because you've got this big difference, does that mean that the list of media sources are different? Now, is it the same 10 organizations across all three groups, or, or does it differ? You would maybe expect some of the, the TV channels, the 7s, 8s, and 10s, to pop up maybe for the younger generation, or maybe even a, media, a digital media source. And we find it's actually pretty universal. The top 10 across all three groups is very, very similar, if not exactly the same. The reason why we don't have results for some of the print media is because they just don't use it. Our base sizes are too small, so it's less than 50 people who use those sources. But they still rank in the top 10 among those who do use them. So that was quite Can a I just ask a question on that? Is that so the question was, uh, if you use television, how much do you trust it, or do you trust it? Because I think statistically, there's some research that shows that young people don't watch much television at all anymore. No. So, you would have to have used it. If you use it, you would need to rate it. If you don't use it, you wouldn't no, rate it. You wouldn't go into the score. So, another question here. Uh, which media source do post millennials, so the 18 to 21 age group, trust more? Do you think they trust CNN? Or do you think they trust Instagram? Is it the spot? It was what source of news do you trust? Where do you think the news is that the question? In terms of the trust question? No, you ask people which, what they trust. Is it what news do you trust or what source of news do you trust? News as opposed to media. Yeah, it's, the, it's do you trust the information that you get from these sources? So basically, on a scale from 1 to 7, how much do you trust the source? The source. The source. And we've got here, we're, top, we're jiggling around a little bit, uh, but Instagram looks like to be the fair winner. And we, we were hoping to trick you on some of these poll questions, but I think, Justin, this is, again, the right answer. Yeah. So definitely Instagram is far more trusted by than CNN, but almost double the amount, which we thought was very, very interesting. Compared to the pre-millennials where it would, it, it, as, 
as the research is telling us, or what the data is telling us, that anything that pre-millennials are getting from or reading on Twitter or uh, Instagram is completely disregarded and has no credibility. Next slide. Okay, which media source is more influential to a company's bad reputation? So this is about negatively influencing the reputation of an organisation. Is newspaper more effective or social media? So yet again, we've got pretty much a clear winner coming out in social media, Justin, for that. But how does that work? I've just told you that social media, people don't trust it. So how if social media, if people don't trust social media, how can it have such a negative impact on the most? negative impact on your reputation. Sorry? More people see it? It's focusing on the profile that you have. So if you're looking at one screen, it's like you're negative, you're making it seem negative, or then that view. Okay. Okay. You you see more of it. It's a repetition. Based on that. Sure, it's very subjective. Also, it's a very subjective channel, isn't it? And it's relationalized too, so people will have a relationship with friends or a relationship with friends. Sure. Does. So, what does the evidence show? So, among people who saw companies through digital media channels, 27% gave them a bad reputation score compared to newspapers. Those people, among people who saw companies in the newspaper news, 36% of people gave it a bad reputation score. So what does that tell us? That newspapers have a more detrimental impact on your overall reputation. So the bad news from newspapers sticks more than from the digital. But it gives you some benefit, right? So being on digital media has its reputation benefits. Obviously it outstrips all the other major channels. So what do you do? I just told you nobody trusts media, digital media channels, but I'm getting reputation benefit from doing it. There's two things happening here. One is that we ask people what they trust and they've told us. So that doesn't necessarily align with the subconscious component, which is really, where am I getting my information from and how much that influences how I perceive organizations and the level of trust that I have towards them. And I guess that compounding impact as well when you've got repetition happening in the mix here. Yeah, you're going to see a lot more coming through in that, in that social media feed than you are through TV and through newspapers. So what do we do? Do we just bury our heads in the sand and just it's all too hard and, and just not engage at all? Well, what the research is telling us is no, because if you don't do anything, for people who have received no information about companies through any source, 42% gave them a bad reputation score and only 48% gave them a good reputation score. So what it's really saying is that any news is pretty much good news because it's going to help improve your reputation. So when we talk about digital channels, we've got to talk about fake news or misinformation. And we thought we would uh, look at a case study from the US. Take you back to 2017. It was the first six months I think, of Donald Trump's presidency. Uh, and the conversation of dreamers came up. Does everybody know what a dreamer is? For those of you who don't, dreamers, if I'm not mistaken, are the children of undocumented immigrants that were basically born, children, um, were born to undocumented immigrants in, whilst in the United States. Right. But I 
Right. Okay. So they, they're, a, they're a hot, political hot potato, let's call it, in the United States. And with Donald Trump's view of um, immigration and immigrants, this became a, a hot topic in around about July or August. Uh, and there was a campaign that started to run on, uh, on Insta um, Twitter sorry, with the hashtag Border Free Coffee, which went viral. Which basically, and the whole premise of the, of, the, um, of the campaign was that if you were a dreamer, you could rock up to Starbucks and you get 40% off your coffee. How they were going to work out who was a dreamer and who wasn't a dreamer, <laughs> don't know. But it went viral. So much so, it got so much traction that the company felt that they had to respond. So the CEO came out at noon and uh, they, they responded to the campaign. Even though it was a fake campaign, had no validity whatsoever, the score dropped by 11 points in just one month. From absolutely <coughs> having no, no credibility whatsoever. So what happened? So our, our hypothesis is that those who weren't in support of dreamers um, basically didn't like Starbucks for this campaign. And then we came, when Starbucks came out saying they had nothing to do with the campaign, those who, who did support um, Dreamers didn't like Starbucks because they weren't supporting Dreamers. So that was, that, that's our hypothesis. And what, what we don't know is that what, what Starbucks needed to do in six months to get its reputation back to where it was, because that is a significant dive in, in, um, in reputation scores. And they must have really been more hands on deck to try and recoup and build that reputation. One of the things that's really difficult when you're in kind of a, a no-win situation like Starbucks were at that point in time, it, within an organisation or whether on a project or a long campaign, is to really be able to strategically work out what are those levers that can get you from you know, a score like 61 back up uh, to where you were beforehand. So we work with a lot of organisations, um, you know, state government, infrastructure organisations, um, and we, we try to understand what's driving their reputation. What are the things that are most important? Because you can't focus on everything. You can't utilize all seven dimensions all the time. You need, you need to kind of really um, focus on the areas where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. So this looks at data from our, our top 60 companies. Um, and it really shows that the services, the core service that you deliver is a key component. If you don't do that, you can't build trust, you can't build reputation. The second most important thing is governance. Being open, transparent, ethical, that, that's really, really hard to do and really hard to demonstrate. So how do you do it? Well, you do it through other ways. You do it by, firstly, building or delivering on your promise in terms of the services that you deliver. You can also build it through your leadership. Open, transparent, ethical leadership, leaders that come out and actually actually show a face behind the organization is really important. And then citizenship, um, being able to have those, those programs that show how you link to the, uh, to the broader community, and then also being able to show how your organization is benefiting the community. What is the core underlying purpose? So who does this really well? Where is there a good news story that we can point to? Right, so it's very easy to find stories where reputation collapses from a crisis. But who's done well to be able to build their reputation? So there's probably um, no better organization to talk about than Telstra. They come from a long way down. In 1975, when the Postmaster General made the announcement that they were going to split the postal, the postal business from the telecommunications business. It's been a long, slow journey for Telstra. And in 2008-2009, they weren't looking like they were in great shape. A score between 40 and 50 is considered weak. So when David Thody took over from uh, Sol Trujillo, uh, the company's reputation was, it was pretty low, and um, David Thody had a, a, a lot of work to do to be able to build that reputation up. So what did he do? Actually, for two years, 
there was no mass communications um, to the market as to what, in terms of the, the community, as to what he was going to do. There was a fundamental change to build reputation from the inside out. And he did that by really making sure that the organization was aligned um, and that they invested not only in digital um, technology and, and the services, but also getting the staff on board, um, making sure the staff were incentivized for the right things, making uh, customers the, the center of, um, of everything that they did. And that's been an incredible journey. And after they've done, after they, they laid that foundation for two years, then they had a big brand and uh, rebrand, uh, which really, um, they were able to deliver on that rebrand, on that rebrand. And um, it's, it's, it's held them for uh, quite a number of years now. Great, so pulling this research that we've been discussing with you today together into practically um, as engagement and communications professionals, what, what do we do to actually uh, take that information and knowledge and use it? Uh, here's a couple of ideas for you. One is just to make sure that you are monitoring the online environment. Uh, I often talk to people about that and say, yeah, we've got someone that maybe does it part-time, uh, or, you know, we've got a couple of people, but, you know, it just, it's a little bit of a sort of a side job for them. Uh, I would really encourage you to have the conversations to find out what really good social media monitoring really looks like. Uh, I love the dark arts of everything online. It's amazing what you can find out. Uh, you can geolocate, you can find out demographics, you can see issues that are trending ahead of time and be in a position really to proactively manage them, uh, whether it's reputation on a company like we've talked about today or some of the really big projects that we're working on. If you know that some issue is starting to trend, it can, you can pivot to what kind of collateral, what story you want to tell, where you want to spend your money and invest your resources. Uh, the next point, and it's been said in many sessions, that you really do need a multi-channel approach. Uh, you, the, that saying that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts is absolutely true for the way that the online environment works now. If you've got a piece of content, let's say you've done a beautiful video and you stick it on YouTube, you are not maximising your bang for your buck. You need to get that posted across all of your other social media platforms. They link they cross-promote, uh, they push up how you're viewed in Google, and then also obviously how you then connect that with the offline environment. If you've done that video, make sure you show it to people, put it on a device, put it on a stand. And so really thinking always about that multi-channel approach. Uh, third point here is about reputation can trump messaging. I hope you like my pun there. <laughs> Um, and I was thinking uh, about something that happened uh, last week down in Sydney that I think is a great example of that analogy. So uh, with uh, basically um, Malcolm Turnbull uh, getting pushed out of his prime ministerial role, they needed to run a by-election in Wentworth. Wentworth is in Sydney, it's a blue ribbon liberal seat, has been since basically that seat was formed. Uh, last week, a independent uh, took that position, and I'm sure anyone that's been reading the news knows the consequences of that. I was reading a really interesting news article, and I was talking about the fact of Karen Phelps as the independent. Uh, her budget for the campaign was really low. Let's call it a million bucks. Yet the Liberals' budget for the campaign, I don't know, let's call it 10 million, but absolutely a big scale and difference there. Uh, and one of the things they were talking about in this news article that I thought was really interesting was all the Liberal campaign materials kept mentioning Karen Phelps again and again and again. So if at the start of the campaign you hadn't heard of her, you definitely did by the end. So again, you've got to think about that reputation effect. Um, and a little bit connecting to what Justin was sharing with us um, with these findings, um, you know, there is a point where things are repeated so much, it starts to just get into our vocabulary and into our psyche. Uh, and Trump with the, uh, I think it was the hashtag, we get Hillary. Uh, absolutely, it was that just repetition of messaging across all of the channels that had a really staggering impact. Not necessarily the best message, but it was there. Um, online content influences Google. So I thought it was fascinating that slide where we did that poll question 
on, you know, is Google trusted? And the answer is yes, it is isn't news, it is an aggregator. Uh, but everyone, basically in our society, is the first point of call to where we go to get information, where we want to discover, where we want to understand what's going on. So if you're an organisation, if you work in government, if you're running a project, don't ignore what's happening on Google. Um, if you're familiar with SEO, meaning search engine optimization, it's the dark arts again that I refer to in how you make sure that the content you want to be seen keeps coming up the ranking on Google. I know, personally, I'm not flicking through to the second page of Google. I will trust what's on that first page and use it, you know, 19 out of 20 times. So if you haven't got people in-house or within your, I guess, advisory network helping you with this space, I think it's definitely worthwhile just taking a little bit of time again to the people that are experts in that area. Uh, they will talk to you a lot about the idea of earned, owned and paid content and media. So earned is where you've got another party that talks about your organisation or shares your content or writes a story about you. A lot of those news channels that we looked at in the research, for example, where you can get earned media. Uh, you've got your own, so that's where you write your own thought piece, your own web page, your own post that you might put on Facebook, for example, making sure that you're getting, again, bang for your buck. Uh, and then pay as well. Um, so we all know very traditional um, paid advertising for uh, you know, paper print. Uh, we've also got the digital newsprint where you can pay for advertising. Uh, but there's a lot of other um, services that are coming online now, such as Outbrainer is probably one of my favourites, uh, where for quite a small amount of investment, you can really get really broad coverage. It also has the ability to, to target it. So again, you can geo-target it, demographic target it, target it at the time of day, uh, target it to the audience that you might want to reach. You can bring content out from behind the paywalls. So lots of things that you can investigate there. Uh, to really get your company up in that ranking with the content you want seen most. And then lastly is, you know, hopefully you've been a little bit inspired with some of the, the work that we've shown from the Reputation Institute, that wheel and understanding the levers. Um, I've personally had experience of working on that for many, many years. Um, it was a great kind of device that I could take to the executives where we're all sort of scratching our heads thinking, what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to do more of to actually have that hard data? Um, we were able to compare ourselves to our competitors to other industries. We were able to try things and see if it shifted the dial. Um, and obviously, Justin um, is available after this, or so you've got his contact details there. If for some reason you wanted to reach out with him, uh, we're both based in Sydney. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes, we have four minutes left, so as promised, we want to leave some time for any questions, thoughts, comments, you know, pretty much a free fall um, on anything that you've seen in this presentation. Yeah, please. Um, you mentioned social media monitoring. What does good social media monitoring look like? Yeah, okay. Do you have any ideas around that? Yeah, I do. I think what's, what social media monitoring looks like is making sure that you're using the right tool. Um, I think the best that, that I've seen, best organisations, typically would run two dashboards because what you can buy off you know, the marketplace at the moment tend to have, you know, they're skewed towards being good at one thing, not necessarily all of it. So thinking about that coverage. Um, if you're in a really media-rich environment, good social media means having someone there all the time watching it, um, it isn't nine to five. Uh, it also is having whoever's running it for you really deeply understand the business and the issues that are important to the stakeholders. So I often find you've got someone monitoring social media but they're just looking at all of the really standard obvious things. It's quite often the more tangential topics that will actually come and, and kind of blindside you. So, they're kind of my thoughts on, on what to do. And like everything in the digital space, it's moving at pace, so you can't get complacent with it. Was there another question? Yeah. I was going to ask if you've done much digital 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 
That's a really good question. So just to reiterate the question, you know, we've all got, when you're on Google, you see the advertise space that often comes up high. Um, is that more trusted versus the, the natural search that comes up? Have you got any experience? So in our experience is that when, we, when we've done a lot of research for companies, when we ask uh, about the news awareness, if you come across any news in general, people often confuse advertising and news. So they just remember seeing a company, but they can't really differentiate between an ad that they might have seen or a headline on a digital source. Just the impression in general. Yeah. I've seen it, it's out there. I've read it. Yeah, and I, I work with PIR agencies, and for them, they don't really care where it comes from. I mean, obviously, if, you, if it's cheap and you don't have to pay for it, that's better for the bottom line. Uh, but I think to, to answer your question, it's it's the fact that there was eyeballs on it. Um, and again, that point earlier about repetition. Yeah. We're out of time. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. Thank you, Justin, for coming and sharing your knowledge. Uh, we're here, chat to us. Um, otherwise, I wish you all a safe journey home.